Okay. Uh, I guess it's class time now. I'd like to start out uh, with a couple of, first I'd like to uh, apologize to people that I wasn't here on Thursday. It was sort of an unavoidable thing um, that came up and uh, this should not happen again this semester. Um, I hope people watch the uh, video. I know some people left early, but uh, I hope people either have seen it originally or uh, either sort of live or, or watch the video about what's been happening in, you know, in the markets here. Um, did anybody have any comments after watching it or seeing it or after, remember this was about that forum that the business school ran, okay, about what were the sources of the problem and the extent of the problem, and there were like five business professors who were talking about that. I don't know if anybody had any reaction after watching it or hearing it or anything like that. You know, I found it very interesting. The thing that was interesting was, of course, that everybody had a different take as to what was happening and uh, why it was happening and how bad it was or was not. And that's a sign that it was a, you know, that it's a complicated thing that not everyone, that, that, that very few people can really say they completely understand what is going on in the world financially, okay? Has anything interesting happened in the world the last couple of, since, since we had class, okay? I guess um, not really, since I guess last Thursday, the stock market is back to where it was last Thursday. But there, in the intervening time, it went all the way down and it went all the way up, okay? And, um, you know, complicated times we live in. Any questions about the world? or anything like that. Okay, one um, other bit of, let's say, news that's kind of, I find kind of interesting, let's say relevant to this class the last couple of days, has been the, I guess this, maybe, was it yesterday or this, yesterday, the Nobel Prize in Economics was given to a guy named um, Paul Krugman. And has anyone ever heard of this guy beforehand? The Nobel Prize was given out. It's given to a guy named Paul Krugman. And um, the only reason I want to mention this, I think is his name. And uh, the only reason I want to mention it is that uh, he is the author of a column that appears in the New York Times twice a week. And he is always, in my mind, the most perceptive, most correct opinion analyst that I have ever seen. Okay, so somehow when. Uh, you know, when I read the newspaper, you know, I see bad news, I say, ah, you know, I see uh, uh, some idiots talking, I say, that's an idiot. When I see this guy write, I feel he's telling me the truth, okay? He seems, to, you know, he knows what's going, obviously he knows what's going on if they just gave him the Nobel Prize. And uh, his interest, his, his research interest was in world trade and stuff. So I kind of encourage people, uh, if they're interested in, you know, if, if they read things, on, you know, interested in economics on any level of what's happening in the world, his is a view that matters. Okay, any other questions? Any questions about him or any related topic? Is he famous? So is he famous? Um, apparently what he is is more famous than most, um, so he's famous to me. Every, every two, you know, twice a week I read my newspaper and I, I say, damn it, this guy's right, okay? Um, and he writes for what is, you know, in principle, the most prestigious U.S. newspaper. And so by that, certainly among the, let's say, uh, you know, intellectual elite or whatever, he would be famous. Um, you know, uh, would the man on, you know, what percentage of the people have, have heard of him on, in America? I don't know if I would make a guess. You know, it's less than Madonna, but it's probably more than the guy who's the, who's the uh, you know, head of Hong Kong now, okay? So it's a scale in there. But he's, 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 a very, he's a very interesting guy, very clear thinker, and I encourage you to read his columns. Any other questions about Paul Brueggemann, okay, or about the economy or anything else like that? Finally, the other um, business, again, uh, I want to see the pro pro program, pro the proposals for the projects are due today. Some people have turned them in. I've got a couple more here. Make sure I get a printed copy of it. I'm going to read through it, and hopefully in time for next class, I'll be able to give you some feedback about how to proceed. Okay? Any questions about projects? Okay. Finally, um, what I'd like to do now is move on. It's been a little bit of a gap since the last lecture. But what we were talking about was, um, had, had to do with binomial trees, if we remember. Okay? And what were binomial trees? They were these you know, I consider it to be lattice-like structures. Actually, how does this go? Okay. 
Okay, boom, 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 boom. Lattice-like structures, okay, which we were interpreting in some sense as, you know, random walk covering somehow all possible price walks that could happen starting from a particular price, okay? Each node in the tree had an upward movement and a downward movement. There was a volume of movement, okay? Um, and there was a probability of going up or down. And based on that, you could now figure out if you could use that as a random walk model to now walk through this thing and figure out what is the probability that you will end up at any one of these price nodes on the right. You could do this by doing random walks, but we argued there was a better way to compute it. That in some sense, if you wanted to compute the probability of getting at any one of these nodes, okay, you could do it by a dynamic programming-like argument. Because the probability of getting to here is the probability of getting to here times the downward motion, the, uh, uh, time, uh, times the probability of going down plus the probability of getting to here times the probability of going up, okay? And that would give you an exact measure for what that probability was. And this is what we called was a binomial tree. And this should have given everybody a reasonably clear vision as to how you could compute a price distribution for a stock. Once you know the, what the right value for the upward movement and downward movement is at every stage, and how you would compute what the probability of an upward movement or downward movement is, okay? We might just say, well, we go up by 1%, down by 1%, we, uh, we, 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 we set a, a, the probability of going up as being 50%, but that's really in some sense guessing. There's no sort of principle behind that. And what's interesting is the topic we'll talk about today is risk neutral valuation provides a principle for setting these, um, these upward and downward motions in the context of option pricing, okay? Any questions about that? What we're doing or why or where we were? Okay, so the last slide I showed last time, just to put everybody's head into it, was um, by saying that one way um, we could think about a, uh, the probability of an upward movement or a downward movement, okay? might be to um, think about a world where, um, let's say that we have an upward movement where we multiply it by P for an upward, by B, uh, b b multiply it up for an upward movement or go down by a downward movement. One argument that we could make is to figure out what the right probability is, is to say that suppose that we lived in a world where investors only held, um, could either hold, a do had a dollar, and they could do one of two things with it. They could either put it into stock, okay, or they could put it in the bank. And if they put it in the bank, they would earn the risk-free rate of R. If people didn't care, if you had what we would consider a risk-neutral investor, or a, let's say an oblivious investor, who did, couldn't really tell the difference between these two, okay, um, they wouldn't care which one of these to own. And if the world was populated by all of these, in principle, the return on the stock would be no different than the return on the money in the bank, okay? And so if so, one can, can start to think about, okay, what would be the way that you would set it, okay? Could, could that there, there'd be somehow a way that we could set what the probability of an upward movement or a downward movement is so that the expected return matches that of the risk-free portfolio. We know that the risk-free portfolio, after one unit of time, will have turned that $1 into 1 plus R, okay? Okay, there's some interest rate movement up, okay? The stock will return if we have a world where, in a single step, we could either multiply it by alpha or divide it by alpha, okay, the value of the stock afterwards would be on an upward movement, which would occur with a probability beta, it would be 1 times alpha times beta, okay, or beta alpha, 
In the case that there was a downward movement, there'd be a one minus beta probability of that. And the value of our holdings would be divided by alpha. Okay? So that's the, that formula on the right would give us what the expected value of this is. Okay? We have the fixed return from the risk-free portfolio. We have the expected return from the stock portfolio. If nobody cared which one they owned, then by setting them equal, beta would give us the returns equal to the risk-free portfolio. And that would give us a, an arguable way to set what that probability is. So everybody's sort of safe. Okay? Now, this may not be very satisfying for one reason, at least there may be a couple reasons why it's not satisfying. The reason that's not satisfying to me is it sounds ridiculous. There is a reason between why someone would care about owning stock or um, owning, um, you know, or, or owning cash. People, investors are not, ri not risk neutral. And in principle, it would seem that people need to be paid, you know, to take a riskier investment, they have to be paid a premium. But this gives us an idea that we can use portfolios that exist to set what these upward and downward probabilities might be. Okay? Any questions here? And we're now going to explore that idea a little bit more. Any questions? So when people use binomial trees to uh, evaluate options, they usually use this idea of risk-neutral valuation. Okay? And the, the, the world that we're going to look at okay, is going to be modeled by that tree down there. Okay? Suppose we live in a world, this is an example, where the stock price is currently 20, and either it's going to go up or down in the next time interval. Here we say it's three months. Okay? Um, and we say that because, let's say the upward movement was $2 and the downward movement was $2. Okay? We have a single step binomial trade with the property that it, now we have a stock price of $20, okay? And three months from now, we know that it will either be at 22 or 18, okay? Any questions about that? That's sort of our binomial model here. Now the question is, if we know this is the way the world is, can we use this to price a European call, okay? for a strike price of 21, okay? So suppose we have a European call option, okay, which means it's a right to buy the stock at a particular price, right? And that you can only execute it on the last day of business, right? And let's say that the last day of business is three months from now, okay? So this is today. These are the possibilities three months from now. Okay? If we have a European call option, okay, at, with a strike price of 21, what would it be worth if the price, if, if the price went up to 22? Okay? How, what would it be worth? One. Why is it one? Well, it's 22 minus 21 is 1, right? The current, the, the price at that moment when you could execute the option was 22. You could buy the thing at, at 21. The value of being able to buy it at that very moment when you buy it is obviously 1, right? Let's look at the downward movement, okay? The stock price is 18. It is now at the moment when you can execute your European option. You have an option to buy it at 21. What is this European option worth? It's worth zero. Why is it worth zero? Well, you have a choice. You can go to the store and buy the stock for 18, or you could pay somebody else $21 for it. Okay, the right to pay the $21 is worthless, right? So it's clear that we can evaluate the, um, op the, the value of the option at the, the rightmost part of this, this tree, right? The question is, what is the value of the option here? Okay, the time that it's interesting to buy the option is three months before the expiration date, right? 
what would be the value of the option? And if this was the world we lived in, okay, we know everything we need to know to price that option except one thing. What is it that we don't have yet to price that option? You say the interest rate? Well, the, the interest rate might be helpful. But what's the thing that, that, that clearly is helpful to know right now? Okay. What? The probability of going up or down. Okay. Is that what, is that what you said? Okay. That if we knew the probability of going up, suppose I knew, let's say we, you do need to know the interest rate to know how much to discount the value of this money, right? How much is a dollar worth three months from now is really something you would want to know to price it, right? But the bigger question you want to know is what is the probability of going up to there and down to there? In some sense, if the probability of going up was 50%, the value of the option should be one half a times one dollar discounted by the interest rate. Okay, and so I argue that the, the, the process of pricing it reduces the figuring out that upward movement. Any questions? So we're going to use this idea of risk neutral out evaluation to figure out what that probability is, but in a more rigorous way than I did on the first slide. On the first slide, I said, oh, we live in a world where, no, suppose we live in a world where nobody cared about risk. I want to do something different here. I am going to set up two portfolios. I'll use an arbitrage type argument. Okay? I am going to construct two risk, risk two portfolios. Okay? Um, both of which are riskless. One of which is simply going to be basically the interest free, it, you know, the, the interest rates. Okay? The other is something corresponding to the stock owning some owning and selling some combination of the stock and the option. If I can argue that both of them are riskless, I know what the value of the return of, of the, um, what you call it? If I argue that both of these portfolios are then riskless, I would then know what their return is. If my risk, one of my riskless one is are defined in terms of things that I know and the price of an option, I can then use this to solve for the option price. Okay, and that's basically the idea that we're going to be using here. Any questions? Let's make that more precise. Okay? Suppose we are back in, and maybe I should draw this on the board here. Here, our choices are in one state. Okay? We are here. We're at $20. We have a choice of going to 22 or 18, and the strike price of the option was 21, if I remember correct, right? Let's go back and look at this picture a little more closely. Suppose I buy a, um, construct a portfolio of where I buy delta shares of um, the stock, and I sell a short position in a call option. Okay? So let's remind us what that actually means. Okay, what is a call option? Call option returned like that. Selling the call option gave me a uh, payoff like this. Does everyone remember that? Okay. So what is the situation? I am going to own, okay, um, delta shares of my stock and a short position in the call. Okay? If the stock moves up to to um, 22, what will my portfolio be worth? Okay? I will have delta shares of stock, 22 times delta is the value of the stock. The I sold, okay, one of the call options the call option would have made at, at a price of 22 would be worth one dollar. Because I sold that, my portfolio was going to be worth minus one dollar. Okay, because I have to pay that one dollar to the guy who, who owns the option that I sold him. Right? 
Does everybody agree that the value of my portfolio should be this? If the stock, any questions about that? If the stock moved to $18, what would my portfolio be worth? Okay? The bad news is that my, board, my stock is worth less. Okay? It's worth 18 times the number of shares that I have. The good news is that I don't have to pay the guy for the option because the option is now underwater. Does everybody see that? Right? So if the stock went up, okay, um, it would be worth this. If the stock went down, it would be worth that. What's interesting is, if I can set this portfolio equal to that portfolio, I will have a property where I don't care whether it goes up or down, because the value of the stock of the portfolio will be the exact same thing. So if I set 22 delta minus $1 equal to 18 delta, okay, and solve for delta, what is delta? I think that then comes out to be... 22 minus 18 is 4, right? So that's 4 delta equals a dollar. That would say that delta is a quarter share. So what's interesting about this portfolio? This portfolio is going to be worth the exact same thing, whether it goes up, whether the, the stock moves up or down. Any questions about that? Yes? What is the one mean? One share, dollar one times. Oh, the dollar one is this is from the payoff of the option. Yes. Remember what my op, my, 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 my situation is. I bought my, my portfolio that I'm going to be talking about. Okay? Consists of delta shares of stock and having sold one position in the call uh, one call option. Then why is one but not uh, delta? No, but, but that's because there's two separate things. There is, the portfolio consists of two things. It consists of owning a certain number of shares and having sold somebody else a call option. Okay? So I sold one call option. Okay? And I bought a certain amount of shares of stock. Okay? The value of the stock itself is going to be 22 delta if it went up and 18 delta if it went down. Okay? The value of the option I sold is going to be worth one dollar to the guy that owned the, 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 um, uh, the option. But I don't own the option. I sold it. So I owe him the money. Okay? So my situation, if the stock goes up, I'm happy because my stock went up. But I'm sad because I have to pay the guy the option. Here, if the stock goes down, I am sad because my stock went down. But I am happy because I don't have to pay the guy the option. Okay? Does everybody see that? And what's interesting is if I owned exactly one quarter share, if delta was a quarter, the values of whether it went up or down are exactly the same. Right. So shouldn't technically it be in addition to both lines of the amount that we got from selling the option? Um, we will that, we will we will show that, that, that when we actually figure out what the price of the option. Ultimately, the goal is, the, is well, okay. First of all, first of all, I used some money to buy the stock too. So you're not worried about the price where I came up with my money for the the, 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 the price that I used to pay the stock. Perhaps I used my proceedings from, from having sold the option to buy the stock, okay? But the important thing here is I have a portfolio here that is worth the same thing. It is completely hedged, regardless of how the stock moves. My value is unchanged. My value is going to be the same, okay? Any questions about that, okay? So that, so that option means I have one dollar, which means I can buy no matter how much stock I buy. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. I'm not saying anything about whether I'm not saying how I created this portfolio. 
What I just want to say is that having had this thing, I mean, I haven't told you what the value of it is. I haven't told you how much it cost me to set up. That I don't care about. The interesting thing is that if I do buy a quarter share of that stock and then sell it, the interesting thing is you guys are all nervous. You wake up every morning the stock market. Did it go up or down? This guy can sleep like a rock for the next three months. He knows exactly what his value is going to be three months later. That's what's interesting about the portfolio. Okay? That seems like a surprising thing. Okay? In a world where the prices are governed by this model, okay, regardless of what happens in you know what happens in the market over this time, his wealth is going to be exactly the same at the end of the time as at the beginning. That is the interesting thing here. Any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, just imagine if the call also is not available. So after that, then the then the two the, the two numbers is two, 22 delta and 18 delta. So there is no point for us to buy the two sell the call also. Right? Okay, so you're saying, but this is saying this is going to be used. We're doing this theory so we can figure out how to price the value of what the option is. Yes, so we have to assume it, the ability to buy these options exists in this so world. The point is that should we include because someone found buy the call also for me, so there should be a. So the no, 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 but recognize this thing. There is, it cost me something to set up this world, right? Suppose after doing some wheeling and dealing, I am now in a world where, okay, I own a quarter share of stock and I have sold somebody one option. Okay, I am perfectly capable of having this happen to me if I have money in my wallet now, right? The interesting thing about it is, if this is true, if I have this portfolio, and this is the scenarios for what can happen to the stock, although it is in principle, there is some risk, some uncertainty. For my portfolio, there is no uncertainty. Regardless of what happens in the world, three months from now, I will have okay, a portfolio that is worth exactly the same amount. Okay? Any questions? Okay, what is it going to be worth? Let's get figure. Let, let's get more precise here. Right now, what is this portfolio worth? If it's going to be worth the same amount, I had a quarter share of stock, right? What's a quarter share of an eighteen dollar stock worth? That's four and a half dollars, right? Right. It's four times a quarter divided by four. Take out sixteen. That's four and a half, right? So if I own a quarter share of stock in this world, my portfolio is worth four and a half dollars. And in this world, okay, my portfolio is going to be worth four and a half dollars. Regardless of how I got to it, three months from now I will have four and a half dollars. Regardless of whether the market goes up or down. I am somehow completely hedged against movements in the market. Any questions here? Okay, that's what's interesting about it. You may say, well, kind of weird, but so what? Okay. Again, how much is this portfolio worth today? We agree that, um, you know, somehow um, at the time that this thing is sold, okay, it's going to be worth, okay, Today I owned a quarter share of stock and the, uh, the responsibility for the option. Three months from now, regardless of what happens, it's going to be worth $4.50 at that time. Okay? The value of my portfolio now should be given by, okay, the um, value of the money then discounted by the interest rate. Does that make sense? If you want to figure out how, how much is this portfolio worth, regardless of what happens to the market, okay, it is going to be worth 453 months from now. Therefore, it's worth a little bit less now, where that less is being given by. It's worth how much do I put in the bank so it's worth 450 then? Okay, that's the discounted value. Okay? Any questions? Well, what's interesting about that now? 
What was the value of the option then today? We know that today, okay, I bought a quarter share at $20, okay? I sold an option, okay? So I am responsible for the option. My value of the um, portfolio is gonna be this. This gives me a way to price what the value of this option is. That's the interesting thing, okay? Let's go back and look at it one more time, okay? At this moment in time, okay, we agree that at this point in time, whether it goes up or down, the portfolio V is worth $4.50. That means that going back down to here, this is worth the discounted value of what V is, right? But what is this portfolio equal to? This portfolio is equal to Delta shares of stock at $20 minus the cost of the um, option. So we have two ways to price what this portfolio is. We know that this thing is going to be equal to the discounted value. Let's say that V is equal to the discounted value of this. Okay. This gives me a way to price what the option has to be equal to. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Okay. Can you just sell all options regardless of the just the pure nothing? Because here, there is a point point two five. Then that means you have one share. Then you need to write a full option. Okay, so what you're telling me is I think you're complaining I can't buy a quarter share. Okay? So if I can't buy a quarter share, the world is not going to be changed if I buy one share and sell four options. But I mean, I mean you have uh, much more option, uh, more options than the stock share. Then it is oh, there's no problem with that. I can go to the, st not the store, the exchange now and buy call options, I mean, okay? I mean, you, you are an institution, and then, for example, uh, extreme cases, uh, you own all the stocks, and then you, you issue four times of the stock. I mean, I okay, so you're saying, you're saying there might be some problem in the breakdown in the long term if everybody, you know, uh, you know that you couldn't do this indefinitely, okay? And maybe I want, okay, let's say, let's say maybe, okay? But I don't think that's the, really the interesting case, because right now I can do this today on at least a small scale, okay? You can agree that, that there's no reason why I can't sell a call option. If I'm, if I'm you know, if I'm, I, I'm not going to say Lehman can't do it anymore, but if I'm Goldman Sachs, I can sell a call option, right? Can I buy a quarter share of stock? Well, maybe not, but if I'm Goldman Sachs, I can certainly buy one share of stock and sell four call options. But uh, if, uh, if the call option is going to be executed in the future, then I mean, I mean there is Okay, so there's a question here. Okay, what you're, I think, getting hung up about, okay, is this question of whether I am allowed to use naked options, okay? So what I'm going to say is don't get hung up on it, okay? Let's say Goldman Sachs is allowed to issue naked options, okay? The interesting thing is, and this is going to be a conceptual idea for why we can price this stock, price the value of an option, okay, in this world. Any questions? Just look at it one last time to look at the example. We'll look at the general case in a few minutes, but I want you to understand the example because the example is actually quite interesting, okay? If we think about it today, what does it cost to set up this portfolio? I have to buy a quarter share of stock, so it's a quarter times 20. And I get, I'm selling a call option, great, I'm going to be getting F dollars, where F is the value of the call option, right? So that's what this portfolio is worth today. We know three months from now the portfolio is worth 450. 
And by doing this counting, we know exactly what the portfolio is worth today. A little less than 450, okay, depending upon what the interest rates are. So what is neat about this? What's neat about this is this is a known quantity. This is a quarter. This here is a known quantity. It's 437 or whatever else the discounted thing is at that rate, right? And the one thing that isn't known is the price of the option, okay? And what's interesting is this gives you an argument <coughs> for what that option is worth, okay? And it's not just a question of what it's worth to me, if it's worth this much to me, if this is the right value of it. In principle, it's worth this much to everybody. And this is the right price for the option. Any questions? Yes? So the, the price of the option that we get at the end does not depend on the probability of the stock going up or down? Well, what we're going to say is different. The probability, the, 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 the price of the option is completely, the, is equivalent to the probability. Okay? Note that if this is, if I know that the price of the option is ultimately worth, let's say I know that the, the option, ultimate value of the option is one half dollar, okay? I can figure out what is the probability here that um, I would, of an upward movement, because on the upward movement I get this and on the downward movement I get this. So what I'm saying here is that sometimes I have implicitly computed the, the value, of, the, the probability of going up or down by computing the value of the option. They're really the same thing. Okay, let me say that again because that seems confusing. If we live in this world, okay, where the option is worth $1 if it goes up and nothing if it goes down, I know the exact value of the option if I know the probability of going up. Does you agree with that? If the probability of going up is one half, the value of the option is one half times one, because I would get one dollar for this, right? Plus one half times zero. So in some sense, the price of the option gave me the probability and the probability gave me the price of the option. What I have done is show you a way to compute the price of the option, which is, in, is equivalent to telling me what the probability is of going up. Any questions about that? Because in that expression, it does not, it does not involve any of the operating so, so if you, I mean 20 delta minus F is zero. Yeah. Because V is not calculated with with use of any of the probability, and 20 delta is not involved in the probability, that means the option price is also not involved in the probability. That's actually the interesting thing here. Somehow the option price does not require, so finding the option price here did not require finding the probability. That's the interesting thing here, okay? The option price is in some sense the equivalent of the probability. But we did not need to know that probability to compute the option price. Okay? Yes? You come on page 18, right? You pick the, the possible options uh, 18, right? Right. Let's just uh, come on. Okay, so you're saying, well, uh, you're saying, how do we know the future is going to play out like this? Okay? Or, 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 no, what, are you, what is your question? No, I'm just saying that we is actually a random thing in a sense because you just show me the, the start will be 18, right? So you come out with the V and then you calculate the uh, other value. Okay. Is it, 18 is a random thing you pick. Okay, so no, so, so basically what the 18 comes from, we assume that we are in a world where the price in a binomial tree world, we have a, at any time step, there is an upward probability, there is a down, there is an upward possible movement, there is a downward possible movement. Here we assume the upward movement was 22, there we assumed it was 18. If we live in this world, okay, we can figure out what the right probability of upward movement is through this argument, okay? 
or equivalently the value of this option. And maybe that's the better thing to think about because that's really what we care about, is the value of the option. Okay? And the interesting thing is that, that, that the value of this option, a European uh, call for the strike price of 21 three months from now, is given by the solution to this equation. Does that answer you or probably not? Okay, close enough. Any questions here? How many people sort of get it? How many people don't get it? Okay, any questions about not getting it? It's an interesting idea. Okay? But it, it's one of these arbitrage things that it's because the fact that we know what the portfolio is worth. We, if the portfolio is worth the same thing when it goes up or down, the movement stock, underlying stock goes up or down. We know exactly what the portfolio is worth. And if the portfolio is made of two things, one thing we know the cost of and the other thing we don't, we can solve for the thing we don't. And that thing that we don't is the price of the option. Any questions? Yes? So if the profit of going to $20 is only 0.1 and profit of going to 18 is not 0.9, yeah. then would, that, would your value be the same? Well, the answer is, what does it mean? You're saying if in the underlying world, okay, there was this real probability, the, pro the price of the option still has to be worth what I say it is worth, okay? And the reason is the following. It's, this is the counterintuitive thing. This is a deep thing, okay? But the argument here is that the world is full of speculators. Right? What are the type of investors? They were inv speculators, they were hedgers, they were arbitragers. Right? If the price of the option was different than this, an arbitrager could come along and guarantee themselves a profit for doing this. Right? And they would keep doing it again and again until you say they consume all the options or so available. Okay, since that bothered you. Okay? I could lock in a profit by doing this, okay? So if even if you come to a world where Bush is going to make an announcement here, let's say he's going to announce the probability of an upward movement is 0.9, okay? The arbitrager faced with this situation can make money, okay? Can guarantee themselves a profit if the price of the option is not this. Okay? Because they, they, can, they, they, they have a portfolio here that they can lock in a... They, they, they're hedged somehow against this. Okay? So, 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 so the argument here of risk-neutral evaluation is in some sense it doesn't matter what the up, real upward movement is. Okay? We can price what the option is worth based on what the arbitragers would be able to do Okay, if it wasn't priced this. Any questions? No, I didn't. That just fell out of the analysis here. Because you, you, you have the equal, you have the, there, oh, there, you have a 20, 22 delta minus 1. That's just a numerical phenomenon in the example. That is not, we'll walk through the general case and see if you still believe that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, first of all, in this case, there's no reason why it is 50-50, okay? It depends upon what, so there's nothing implicit in here that is saying, in this numerical example, it happened to have come out, I said that if this worked, I said what I said was, if this worked out to the value of the option being equal to a, a dollar, half the 50 cents, then there was an upward movement of one half. If the value of this equation, again, I didn't tell you what the risk-free rate is. In fact, here's the argument that, that, that what you're saying can't be right. I didn't tell you what the risk-free rate is here in anywhere in my example, right? It was R. It could be different values, right? 
This value V is going to depend upon the, the risk-free rate, right? So depending upon what the risk-free rate is, this value is going to be different. The, when we solve for F, we are going to get a different value depending upon what the value of the risk-free rate is. And this probability is a function of the option value. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Any questions? So what you mean is that not the probability influence in the awesome price, but the awesome price influence in the probability. In this case, what I would say is that the options price is influencing the probability. In this case, what, what is presumably happening is that the interest that, that the options rises, prices will influence the probability. That I think is, 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 is pretty much right. Okay? Any questions? So what is the principle here? Again, regardless, the portfolio is worth the same at the end of the period. The discounted value of it is known. Okay? We have an equation now with one unknown. We can solve for it that one unknown is the prior value of the option. And this gives us a way to price what the option is worth. Any questions? So what is the general case of this? Okay, let's work, look at it now in the general case, not the example. In general, if there is a, an upward price movement, the value of the option at the end of the, uh, you know, uh, the value of the portfolio, okay, is given by the stock value initially times the upward movement times the number of shares I have minus, okay, the value of the option on an upward movement. Okay, that would have been the one dollar in the example before. Okay, the 22 minus 21. Okay? If there was a downward price movement, okay, the value of this would be the initial stock price times the downward movement times the number of shares minus the value of the option if it goes down. Combining that, I now say that if in fact we want to figure out how many shares of stock do I need to own, so that the value at the end is identical. I set delta, I set the, this equal to that and solve for delta, I get that expression. Any questions? The present value of this delta, so now I have the portfolio, the, 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 the value of it, okay? Okay, I have this thing, the, the up value and the down value, okay? The present value of this portfolio, okay, since it's worth either the upward branch or the downward branch, okay, um, is going to be given by the discounted value of, in that case, the upward value branch, which I could set up for a cost of buying the delta shares of stock and selling the option, okay? So now everything is known in this expression. The initial starting price, S0, the upward movement value that was given, delta is the number of shares of stock, I just computed it, FU was the profit if the option went up on the option, okay? The only thing that is unknown is F. If the present value of the portfolio is this, and I can set it up for that, that means that they're equal, okay? F, I can solve for F, and now this is what it is, okay? Any questions? And to interpret this as a probability, because F is also equal to, you know, the value of the option would be known if I knew the upward or downward movement probability, okay? Once I know the value of F, I can solve for, in some sense, this probability of movement. Okay, and this would be, if you solve for, for beta now, you get that beta is equal to basically the uh, e to the interest, you know, the amount of, in, you know, the e to the RT minus the downward movement, okay, of the stock over the change in the up, upward and downward movements. Any questions about that? Okay, any questions? This is an interesting idea. 
Now, what happens if you do this? What is the expected price movement of the stock? If you go through and think about it, based on the, this argument, I could go and figure out if I know what my upward and downward movement is. I could go and figure out what is the probability of an upward movement or downward movement at each step of this computation. If I now go and compute my binomial tree using those probabilities, <coughs> and if this is the stock price, what would be the return of the stock price generated by these movements? It turns out that, it would, that, that these price movements okay, would reflect the stock growing at price at the risk-free rate. Okay? Somehow that is the assumption in this model okay of what is happening okay um, to the price of the stock okay if you assume these probabilities okay any questions okay so the way to think about what actually the value of an option is as computed by this model it's the expected payoff in a risk neutral world where you discount the value according to the risk free rate any questions about that Okay. So, this model will break down if we have, for example, people ratings of our movie. If you have what? If we have people ratings, for example, for 22 and 18, we have another also another problem, another chance, another op uh, opportunity of having 21, for example. Then we cannot find the equality at all. Okay. So you're telling me what if there was also a possibility you could move here? Yes. Okay, and then it is no longer this binomial, one-step binomial pro process. But you're saying, in fact, that stocks can move over a more complicated range of values. We are going to simulate that by having a multi-stage tree. What is, what is our multi-stage tree doing? We are simulating at the end of the period we get a distribution of many possible values the stock could be at, right? Okay? That is why we're going to have a binomial tree here, okay? Is that we can, in fact, get the richness of having lots of intermediate prices by thinking in terms of still binary upward and downward movements over small periods of time. Any questions? For example, now in, the uh, in this binomial model, we use the option pricing to get the probability. However, when we have a range of a range of possible choice, then the equality for uh, that means the 22 delta minus one equal to 18 delta may not hold for every every opportunity. Well, what's going to be the case as we go through it is we have talked about what is the pricing in some sense for this little last step between a current point and the expiration price where the prices are clear. We are going to go working backwards to determine this for, for longer periods. Okay, Actually, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Ask your question one more time. Or, or, or follow through. With okay, follow through. Uh, in the binomial tree model, yeah. we, uh, we, use, we compute the awesome price. And then right. use the option price to deduce okay. the possibility. Okay, let's think, what is our goal here? Your goal, fundamental goal, is not to figure out whether option stocks are going up or down. Your fundamental goal is to price options. That is why we're going through this whole business. Okay? So the, the way that you should be excited about this is I have given you a way to price an option. That is the exciting thing. Okay? And that... It didn't require you to make a judgment in some sense about what the probability of going up or down is. Figuring out if it's going to go up or down tomorrow is a tricky business, right? Google, is Google going up or down tomorrow? Who hears that? What's the probability of it going up or down tomorrow? Okay. I don't know how to figure that out in some cosmic sense. Okay, if I did, I would be investing in the stock market. I would, I would know the future, right? Instead, what we are doing is finding a way to price the option without really knowing what it's going to do in the real world. 
by observing that if the price was not this, there would be arbitrage possibilities that would drive the price to this. That is sort of what the argument is. Okay? So the thing to get not hung up on is not what is the probability of an upward movement. Because ultimately all that we are computing, if you think about the, what these probabilities mean as probabilities, they're just going to generate growth at the risk-free rate. Okay? The more interesting thing is that it gives a way of pricing what the option is. Any questions? Okay? So again, this is what we've been saying and getting hung up on. Okay? Is that, in some sense, the value of the option is its risk-free neutral, neutral valuation, because if not, there existed an arbitrage opportunity, okay, to buying it, you know, in the right portfolio. If you think about this portfolio, my portfolio was going to be unchanged, okay, over time. The value of it was going to be, I know what the value of it is, okay, if, uh, you know, if, if, if I had this thing, if the price was substantially different, I have a, a buying opportunity or a selling opportunity for that option, okay, so that I can lock in a profit regardless of what happened. Any questions? Okay. So if you buy this theory, this theory is good because it gives you a way to price the option one after a one-step trade. Now the problem is, as you said, you probably think it's pretty hokey to think we live in a world where this price can either go up or down a fixed amount. Okay, and that's not what's going to happen over three months in reality. The truth is, we can extend this idea to, by building a bigger binomial trade to give us as fine a gradation as we wish okay, of stock prices and use this argument okay, to price the option appropriately. So let's think about what the world is. If this is the price where the option is, um, let's think about our world. If the, this is the expiration time date for our European option. This time period, again, remember, if we think about this as moving through time, this is today the leaf level of our binomial trade was the expiration date for these European options, right? The value of the option was clear at the expiration date, okay? Because you knew at that point if it was in the money or not, and you could sell it and act on it immediately. We used our um, risk neutral product valuation to figure out what the price of the option was at, an inter at the, this node given the terminating prices. We could do the same thing for these two prices. We know the price, that the price of the option at this point and this point is clear. That will define what the value is here. If so, we're now in a situation again where this is not the closing time, this is before the expiration date. But we know what the value of the option is worth at this point. We know what it's worth at this point. We can play the same game we did before to figure out how many shares of, um, of stock do we need to, uh, to buy to create a risk-free portfolio. So we could price the option at this point, given the values there and there, okay? And this is going to give us a way that we can price this entire, the option over this entire binomial tree. Any questions about that? It may seem murky, but let's look at an example here. Here, suppose we built a tree. The upward movements we defined here was an upward movement of it looks like in this each case it was a 10% or, well, there's an upward movement to either go up to 22 or down to 18. The stock price, it started at 20, 
it went up to, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, up, up to 22 or 18. From 18, it went up to 22.4 or down to 19.8. 18, you can see this world. If this was the expiration point, if the price of our call, our, our call price was expiring at 20, at 21, which is what we had the European call, right? It was 21. The difference at this point between 24.2 and 21 was 3.2. At this point, if the price hit here, the value of the option was clearly 3.2. If the price was here, it was less than the strike price, the option was worthless, worthless. Here it is known, by computing our formulas now, we can figure out what the option was worth at this node, what it was worth at that node. By working backwards now, we know I have exactly the same information here as before. We can work back to the root to figure out what the value of the option was at this time. In this example, one dollar twenty-eight. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. This is something that is supposed to, at this point, be seen. If you believe the idea that we can price the option in one step, okay, given the terminating values, which is what I did before, we can keep working backwards because it's the exact same situation from there and propagate the value from the leaves to the root. Any questions? Okay. So what's good about these trees? Well, again, with finer um, gradations, okay, we can get, you know, um, you know, with more levels, we get more uh, 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 the ability to monitor a more seemingly more accurate world where we factor in finer gradations. In practice, if you figure out what the value of an option is as a function of the number of levels, by the time you get to about 30 levels or so, the price generally stabilizes. Okay, the more levels, you can go through this analysis with one level, with two levels, with three levels, you can figure this out for any number of levels that you want. Okay? It turns out that after a certain number of levels, the price basically stabilizes, okay? And this then gives you a, a, a way to compute what is the accurate price of the option, okay? Any questions? In the course of doing these computations, as we move through this, we had to have computed a certain set of, of shares, a certain number of shares to hold to set up the risky portfolio here. And that would be a different number of shares than from here. And that will be a different number of shares than from here. So somehow the process that we're going through with this is as the stock price goes through and does its thing, <coughs> the arbitrager is going to adjust at each step of the, set, set the, each step of the way how many options they buy and sell and how much sh shares they own. Okay, to maintain that everything is risk neutral. Okay, and so there's this world where there's sort of this continuous optimization that the hedger is doing. Okay, but basically, given this kind of process, they can guarantee themselves, okay, the risk free rate by buying and selling appropriately. Any questions? How to determine the 20, 22 entity? Okay, so one question that you're that, that we've left out here is what is the value, what should be the, the, the so I think even you agree that if I give you the, what, what the amount up and down is, okay, you can compute everything. But you're not sure what is the value of up or down, okay? And the answer is you have a certain amount of freedom here, okay? I actually have a slide on this later on, actually, which I'll just go through quickly. I can tell you what values are wrong, okay, for up and down, okay? But there's a range of possible values you can use that are right. 
If this is going to be modeling, let's think about it. We're using this, there's an upward price movement and a downward price movement, right? This is the upward movement, and the upward value and the downward value, right? If the upward value gave you a return in this time of less than the risk-free rate, would you ever consider buying any stock? Let's think about this, right? The upward movement corresponds to what do you get as your return if the stock goes up, right? If the price of the upward movement, the value of it, was not greater than what you would earn in the risk-free rate, under no condition would you, um, what do you call it? Uh, would, would you do that, correct? You would rather, you know, no one would ever own stock in that kind of a world. So it doesn't make sense to have an upward movement that is too small relative to the, to, to the, to the, the, uh, the risk-free rate. And similarly, it doesn't pay for you to have a downward movement that is too high, okay, relative to the risk-free rate. Suppose we lived in a world where my, my, I set the prices where uh, on a, it, the price is now 10, on a good day it'll go to 20, on a bad day it'll go to 19. In this world, regardless of what, I would earn in a risk-free way more than the risk-free rate. And that would be a bad setting for it. Okay? So what we should agree is that there are um, bad values, okay, for what the upward and downward movement should be. There's a range of good values that would still yield interesting results. And I guess it's going to be next class I'll tell you ways that we can maybe set good values for going up and down that have other interesting properties to them. Okay? But I want to get into something else before I go through that. Any questions? Okay. Um, so this binomial tree model, you can generalize in a couple of ways. You could perhaps allow a neutral possibility. You can make it a little more complicated by allowing a transition where the price stays the same. Those become trinomial trees instead of binomial trees. Okay? And maybe the convergence properties are a little bit different. You could factor in other things into binomial tree models, okay, if you're clever enough. One thing to note has to do with dividends. What did we say happens to stock prices when they issue their dividends? Goes down, right? Suppose we know that this week, this instant in time, is when the stock is going to be issuing a dividend, okay? We should have that fact um, has to go into the upper, you know, we, we can use that knowledge to skew the values of our up and down movements to model that phenomenon. Does everybody agree with that? Knowing that it's going to be dividend week, it pays for us to have the downward movement be a little sharper than usual and the upward movement less than usual. Okay? Any questions? We could also factor a world where interest rates may not be constant, right? Suppose by having we have some kind of a model of interest rates where the risk-free interest rate is going to be different. It's going to change over time. Right now, the risk-free rate is um, maybe very high. Now that they're flood, you know, because they're flooding the market with money, it's going to be lower in the near future. We could factor in our models of what interest rates do into changing them as time goes by. Okay, so there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do with one of these binomial tree models. Any questions? Now, the other thing that you can, that is important here, is that there's enough flexibility in the idea that we can price American options. Okay, what was the difference between an American option and a European option? It had to do with when I could execute it, right? European options, I could only, you know, execute the option at the um, end of the period. 
American options I could execute at all, any time. Okay? And it was clear an American option was more valuable, but it isn't clear how much to value that freedom. Okay? So, the, the interesting observation is that it pays to execute. If you have an American, let's call it a put. Okay? A put, remember, gave you a payoff like this. Okay? Where if the price was very low, you made a lot of money, right? It would pay to, there might be times when it pays to execute a put ahead of time, ahead of the expiration, if you have that right to do it. What would be an example of it? Suppose, let's say, that you have an, a, an American option, you have a put option for Lehman stock, okay, um, that expires in 2010, okay? Such things do exist, right? The current price of Lehman, okay, is probably not zero, it may be zero, but it's probably not quite zero because the bankruptcy maybe hasn't completely gone through. The price of it is probably 0 0.001, okay? Very, very close to zero, right? Suppose you have a, a put option at $50 on Lehman. You could get $50 minus 0 0.001 now, or if you wait till the end and Lehman finally dies the death it deserves, $50 in 2010. Which is worth more to you? Okay? Or let's think about it this way. If you have a put option where the stock is very, very low now, you had a, a you know, the spread price was high, the current price of the stock is very low, not zero. The maximum value of the put would be if they went bankrupt, right? You have two choices. You could wait until then to execute your put, okay? Or you could execute the put now and take the value of it and put it in the bank. Does everybody agree with that? If the price of the stock is close enough to zero, the potential gains of, of, of holding on to the option, put option further, would be less than the interest that you could get by executing the put option now and putting the money in the bank. Does everybody see that? I think that example should be a clear one. Under this situation, it pays to do the execution now. Okay? Does everybody see that? So how can we factor this in, okay, to our binary tree model? Okay? Basically, it's going to pay to execute our option now whenever the payoff from immediate execution exceeds the value of the option as defined by our methods from now to, the, to, to expiration. If so, we can factor this cost into our model, okay, by simply making a choice. Here, let's look at a binary trees, binomial trees for pricing a put option, where the initial price of the stock price is 50, the strike strike price is 52, in both European and American cases. In the European case, if let's say that our we had a pretty big spread here, okay, if we have a put. If the price is above the strike price, the put is worth nothing. Here it's four dollars less than the strike price. Here it is fifty-two minus thirty-two, twenty less than the strike price, right? In a European option, we can now figure out here what is the option worth at this point, okay? Because we have the current stock price by using the risk no neutral valuation. Here we could figure out the risk neutral valuation. We get that here the val value of it is 9.4. Given this and this, we can compute the risk neutral valuation is this, which happens to be $4. The value of this put would be 
as a European put. But over here, the price of the stock, the, the stock has dropped enough that between here and here, it can only drop another $8, right? The value of the immediate execution here, I can sell it for 52. My, my, my value of this thing is going to be $12 if I execute it immediately. 12 is bigger than 9.4, okay? I take at every node the bigger of the value of the immediate execution cost and its European evaluation. And that value then gets propagated to raise the value of the American option back at the root. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? So binomial trees are good things. That is sort of the lesson for today. Okay? And that using binomial trees, it should now be clear that I now know how to price an option. Okay? An American option. Okay? Just given these, these probabilities. Just given the interest rates. Okay? The strike prices and the time period. Any question? And this is very good to know because you're now getting your first homework assignment, okay? Which is going to be an assignment where you price options. Okay, so I'm going to pass this out. Just talk about this for a couple minutes, okay? Basically, with binomial trees, I have now explained enough that you can now write a program in principle to price call and put options. Okay, you know all that you need to know to build the binomial tree one. What I'm going to ask you to do is the following. We have set up a database, or not a day, a file of hundreds of options that were for sale on a particular day, okay, in seven different stocks, okay? And we've given you data, all the data that you need in order to price those options. What I want you to do is to basically, for this assignment, implement two different methods for solving, uh, for valuing options, the binomial tree method and the Black-Scholes model, which I'll talk about next class, okay? I want you to experiment with the options that I have there and see what prices your methods give and how they correspond to the price that that option was actually trading at. And I want you to write a short report, a three-page report, about how good are your option pricing methods. I want you to pretend you're a scientist here. And now we have this model for pricing options. Is it good or is it bad? Okay, how sensitive is it to different things? Your assignment is going to be to implement it and uh, implement the methods, run them on the options that we have, and tell me how good or bad your methods are. Any questions? Okay? Any questions about the assignment? Okay, look at this a little bit more. You can ask questions next class if you wish. Next class we will talk about the Black-Scholes model. And um, any, oh, one last question. Okay, any questions? Because if, if there's any questions, this will take, um, this will supersede what I'm going to say. So any questions about the assignment or about what we did today? There is one last, let's say, slide I want to talk about here that uh, just to make sure everybody's head is in the right place about where we are. We talked, if you remember, about this whole pricing thing. I started saying you could make these random walk models, okay, and do these Monte Carlo simulations with random numbers. And then you, I said, wait, there are these binomial trees, and you can compute exact price distributions with binomial trees, right? So the question now is, why does anybody care about my random walks or Monte Carlo simulations? Was that a dumb thing for me to talk about? Okay? And the answer is it's not a dumb, it's not a useless thing. Okay? Let's go, go back and figure out why. First of all, random walk models, like Monte Carlo random walk models, are simpler to conceive than um, the dynamic programming models, these binomial tree models. Okay? So you can be dumber and come up with a Monte Carlo simulation than you can to come up with a binomial tree model. That would be one reason why random Monte Carlo simulation is a good idea, but not a very strong one. The, the, 
Another reason for using Monte Carlo instead of, let's say, random the uh, binomial tree thing is, what if you want your model to have an unbelievably large number of steps? Let's say a, a million steps, which for certain phenomena, maybe you do need random walks of size a million, of one length one million until things converge. If you do a, um, a uh, binomial tree model, in some sense you're doing something that is a million squared. Right? On the last level, you're going to have a million different nodes. The number of nodes on each level increases by one. Right? So a million squared nodes is too big to actually build a binomial tree like that. Right? What's a million squared? Big number. Right? So if you have a big enough time course, you won't be able to compute the exact distribution. But you could do random walks to get some kind of an understanding of the distribution, okay, for as long as you're willing to run the experiment. That is an advantage of random walks, okay? Any questions? But the biggest advantage is that for certain kinds of price models in certain kinds of things, you can't model it by a path-independent approach which is in somehow implicit in the um, binomial tree. In the binomial tree model, we argued that a path that went from here to here was the same as a path that went from here to here. And that's not true in pricing certain kinds of things. Remember when we talked about Asian options? I mentioned them once before. An Asian option, the value of an Asian option was the average price okay over a period of time right if you want to compute what the value of an Asian option would be okay you really can't do it with this kind of a model because there's no memory of what was the path price up to a certain point you have to do it by simulating random walks and taking the average of the prices there so for certain phenomena where there is a state dependency, Hurst random walks turn out to be another example. You cannot really apply dynamic programming in the same way. Okay? And for these, Monte Carlo methods are good things. Any questions? Okay? So our conclusion is binomial random walks are good things. For our purposes, binomial trees are better things. Okay? For pricing simple options. And next class we will look at the Black-Scholes equation, which may be an even better thing. Okay? And we'll talk about that next time. Any questions? Thanks for your attention, and please turn in your project proposal if you haven't done so already. Thank you.